Right, thank you. Can you hear me at the back all right? Good. I probably won't be able to hear you, but never mind. Okay. Um, this is a selection of the present ideas for tidal stream generation. And the one thing that you notice is that all the rotors are rather a long way apart. Okay, those are probably the closest ones, but nearly always there's several diameters gaps between them and a lot of height above them. And I'd like you to imagine that you're building a conventional hydroelectric scheme and somebody from the health and safety said, oh, you can't have all these pipes going to your turbine, you must have an extra 20 pipes that is running freely. Okay, down the hill, not doing any power, got to have that, that's the rules from the EC. This would be crazy, and this is exactly what's happening in the gaps between these things here. The water's rushing through, and it's creating lots of horrible turbulence. Well, a long time ago, about 1998, uh, I came up with a, a, a way of using a new kind of power takeoff for tidal stream, and it looks a bit like that, a bit old-fashioned now. But the basic idea is it's rotating about a vertical axis. It's got a whole bunch of foils around here, which are symmetrical foils, and they are able to change pitch. And the power, all the power takeoff is inside that yellow thing up there. It's a thing called a ring cam. And uh, then I thought a bit more about it. And the equation that everybody uses for tidal stream generation is this one. It's due to a couple of people called Lanchester and Betts. And it's so familiar that I don't need to tell you what the notation is. But if you are putting uh, t turbines into a pipe, into a duct, you'd use a quite different equation, which would be just the rho g, the head of the from gravity in the area, and the first power of the velocity here. Okay, So we've got a little bit of head here. We've got or, or, or the, the area will be the, be the same, but we've got a first power on the, on the velocity equation. So we've got these two, two separate equations, one for an open field flow and one for a thing in a pipe. And if we cross out the common terms, we're left with a cube law here and a first power law here. And I'm arguing that if you have a lot of turbines in a duct, you should be looking more at this equation. The first one you put in will be in an open flow field, at least side to side, maybe not over the top. But later on, when you put a whole lot in, and we do want quite a lot of power, you should be looking much more at this. OK. Now, the difference would be, uh, this is the the typical arrangement. Now, that's actually quite a lot closer than the ones I showed earlier. And I'm trying to block up a much higher fraction of the, uh, of, of, of the, of the flow window. I'm kind of come down as close as I can, as close as I dare to the bottom, sea, so the bottom of the seabed. And I want to go a little bit above. And the water, instead of being able to go through the gaps, has got a much harder job to get, get past. So let's just remind you of that. And I'm trying to say that that's wrong. Okay, well, a chap from Oxford called Ross McAdam did a very nice experiment for a PhD, and here's his rotor. Uh, he's got some blades going across here. It's spinning about this axis here, and he's measuring all sorts of good things, and he finds out that this Betts limit thing is complete rubbish. Oh, that's another rotor that he tested. This one's got um, a helical blades. Uh, this gives a very nice torsionally stiff structure, very attractive, gives you a very smooth power output, but it does make it difficult to change the pitch. And I'm arguing that blade pitch changing is going to be quite important if you're having uh, a low tip speed ratio. So anyway, he, he tested that and uh, he's getting performance figures. Here's the bets limit down here, 0.59, and he's getting over 1.2 when he's blocking off 0.59. Now, you see this blockage is 0.47, this blockage is 0.59. What would be very nice to know is what happened if he went up to 0 0.7, 0 0.8, and so on. And I'm arguing that we'll be getting better and better. The bets limit is quite wrong if you're blocking uh, uh, a large fraction of the flow. Uh, so, sorry, student, couldn't quite get what this number meant. This is the performance coefficient, CP. Here's Betts here, and he's what he's actually measuring because he's blocking a large fraction of the channel. Okay? So all this 16 over 27 is rubbish, I'm saying. Right. Now, another bad thing about the 
convention allowed is that there's a, the, the water flow near the hub is slowed down quite a lot. Sorry, it's, yeah, and, the, and the, the, the water flow around the tips of the blades is accelerated. So you end up with horrible changes of velocity down, downstream. You're making a really dirty wick. And in this one, if you go 20 turbine diameters downstream, you've still only recovered half the power. And the, the, what's happening around the tips is, is giving you terrible eddies and vortices. Here's another picture from the same people. And you can see how the velocity deficit here is uh, balanced by an increase in velocity around, around the tips. Now, I'm arguing that what we want to do is to have control of the rotor so that we are getting the same head across the whole front of the rotor. The way you can do this is to say, here is the foil going around. It's got a bit of a pitch change on. We've got the incoming flow velocity here. We've got the tangential velocity of this thing going around here. It'll see a resultant like that. And what you do is you say, I want to have so much force downstream on this foil. And if I know that the force has got to be the perpendicular to the resultant flow velocity, I've got a lift here. So I need to work out what angle do I want to the angle of instant, to flow, instant flow to give me this amount of force here, which will give me this amount of force downstream. So what we're thinking of is trying to get a nice even pressure drop across this rotor instead of that horrible uh, uneven things. And in fact, when you work, work it out on a sort of slice by slice thing, you can get the right pressure drop that you asked for over about 95% of the frontage of the rotor. And this means that if you've got control of this and you know that there's a bit of extra velocity here, you can actually put a bit more pressure drop where the velocity is higher. So you can produce a weight downstream, which is actually cleaner than what's coming in. If you don't know, if you've got lots of different directions and velocities downstream, how do you know what pitch angle is going to give you the right result? And the answer is you can't tell. So the way that you'd grow this idea would be to have contra-rotating rotors, these ones going around here, these ones coming around here, they're packed as close as possible, close as we dare, there'll be worries about that, but we'll be as close as we can. And what they're going to try and do is to cancel out the cross force. If, you've got, if you're putting a lot of force into a rotor around here, there'll be an equal and opposite force on the water, so it'll be trying to go out that way. The opposite will be happening here, and so if you've got a long row of them, all contra-rotating, they're going to cancel out each other's cross forces. Right. So, let's see what this could look like later on. Come on. Uh, oh, we got to... Yeah, sorry, I'm getting out of order. I've got to change the pitch angle as I go around. This might be a, quite a, 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 a difficult thing to do in a horizontal axis machine, <laughs> but in this machine, we've got lots and lots of room, and the way we're going to... Uh, to do it is to have two hydraulic rounds here which are able to wiggle the foil here. Now, when you first think about this, you think, how on earth are you going to get pitch power onto the rotor to do the pitch actuation? You're going to have big, big slip rings in salt water? Come on. But actually, you don't need to do that at all because when you work out what the torques are on this, for three quarters of the rotation, the water's doing work on the foil and you're letting the foil... You know, trying to stop the foil heading into it. You're, that, so you're generating a useful amount of power, probably kilowatts per e for each foil, which you can use on board the rotor for other purposes. And the way you can do this is to have the oil from these things going into a, a, a rather nice three-bank digital hydraulic machine where you can motor or pump and you can saw extra energy back in the accumulator here. Right, now... This is a beautiful picture from NASA about a crop spraying airplane. Here's a plane here, flying over a, a smoke flare. A stunning picture. But this is showing you that around the, 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 the tip of the blade, you've got a suction on the top of the blade and a pressure bar. There's a tremendous vortex being produced. And this is exactly what's happening around the tips of a horizontal axis turbine. But if you come to this design, you can see that we've got these round red rings, okay, which are suppressing the tip vortex. They're giving a lot of very valuable structural strength, but they're suppressing the tip vortex in a useful way. Um, now, we need to think how we're going to moor this. 
And the first design was to have three rigid uh, concrete tubes, neutrally buoyant, that could be sunk down. And the plan here was that they should be passing in planes which contained the center of pressure. And that would mean that the big, big downstream force that's coming along here is not producing any moment about the center of pressure. And if I can make them going, going through that, that, that area, I'm not going to be having any pitching and rolling. Um, and I thought this was quite a neat idea, but the trouble is that you can't... I was doing it partly because I didn't want to use any seabed space outside the plan area of this rotor. Um, but the trouble with this is that you can't have any spokes across the middle here. All this space is sterilized by those rods. And I've gone off that design now, uh, partly because if I can put spokes in, I can get very much bigger diameter rotors. So the present idea for mooring is to have these links going outwards, outside the rotor, and I can have lots of them in different directions meeting up at the bottom. The, um, have another one. Uh, this would what, be what it would look like in plan view, and another attraction of this is that I can make a quick disconnection down here. I'll show you this a bit later on. And I don't have to have all of these working together. In fact, you can have this, this installation occurring and you can have two simultaneous fault connections without it being catastrophic. Before, when I only had three, if I missed one, then I'd, uh, uh, when, when the current started up again, I'd be in, in trouble. So I've got a, a, a nice arrangement there. And the way they'd look at would be more like this. is looking at a whole row of them. The, there's a very closely packed row here, a second closely <coughs> packed row here, and they're sending power down to a common bus along here. Right? And that would be saving a great deal of wiring on, on the seabed. And the way you might arrange them in the Pennant Firth is shown here. Um, this is probably a bit more than we'd need to have, uh, but you can see there's lots of rows. And the idea is that you've got these double bank ones here, but you can take out this, these guys here want to come out for a refit or something. So there's plenty of space around here to move, to maneuver them, and there, there's, there's just room between them for a, a, a RNLI Atlantic 85 life, lifeboat. So you can get inshore lifeboats going through, but only yeah. just. You're trying to encourage marine traffic to either go along the edge here, or if that's not good enough to have a, a sweep round here. And the gap between here is for tankers who want to get into flotter. Um, and this gap is twice the entrance into Milford Haven, which is a big biggest oil harbour harbor we've got in the UK. So that's what they look like. Probably we'd only have half of those number of rows, but we don't know yet that because of another argument we're coming on later on. Now um, that's a slightly closer view. The entire power takeoff is all inside there. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. Right, let's, I think we could maybe skip that one. This is showing the, the detail of the seabed attachment. Um, now, what, what I've got is a conical steel bit here, and I've got a whole lot of 50 millimeter diameter holes drilled right down into the rock. Okay, a large number of them like that. I think there's 49 there. And these have got post-tensioning connections up here. So I'm putting uh, all the rock in this area around into compression. If we assume that there's no tensile strength in the rock, or maybe there's even some cracks, so there's no strength at all, that doesn't matter <coughs> if we have put it all into compression. There'll be some grout squirted in here. So all the rock around here in this great big volume of rock here has all been pushed into compression and we either increase the compression or we reduce it but we never go into tension. Um, here is the bottom end of one of these mooring legs and it looks a little bit like a butterfly net. We'll look at it a bit more close detail later on. Here we are. Now, uh, this is a, a very strong structure connected up that's going to be putting the rock in here. Here's the bottom end of the leg and this is the butterfly net. And you'll notice that there's three different colours here for three-phase connections. 
And this brown thing is thing looks rather like a bullet, and there's the world's most expensive seals in here. Right? And I've also got three more colours up here, uh, again protected by the world's most expensive seals here, which are on a, a plunger that can come in or out. So what we do is we have to locate this end within about half a diameter of that much, and sort of imagine you're catching a butterfly, and bring it down over the top of this. Now, when we bring it down, it's going to be full of salt water and sand and plankton and God knows what. And so what we do is we pump some fluids down through some hoses here. And the first thing we do is we uh, put in uh, some filtered fresh water, which will blow out all the sand and salt and plankton. All right? Uh, it'll still be wet. Then we blow in some alcohol. Um, whiskey distillery is all around there. So we blow in some alcohol, and that dries out all the water. All right? And then we blow in some air, which blows out all the alcohol, and then we pull a vacuum. And when you work out the fact that you've got a vacuum in here and maybe 70 metres of water pressure above you, you can work out how the force will be trying to close that gap up here like that. And if you look at the angle here, that's actually about 2 degrees. And if you know about Morse tapers, you'll know that we're going to be multiplying the force here. So I can promise you that the enormous forces we're putting into the, the seabed uh, can come through the gap between here. We, having done that, we then push this rod here down, okay, and we make connection. That pushes this brown bullet out of the way, and this allows us to make the three electrical connections here. So in a few minutes of pumping and squishing and, uh, and pushing rods, you can make the mechanical connection and a three-phase, three, 33 kilovolt connection underwater, wet mating, all right? Can't get anybody in the industry interested in that idea, but I think it's quite neat. Right, so the next thing that we want to talk about is the power takeoff. And this is a typical uh, machine. I think that's, is that the old storm? Yeah. And you can see that we've got lovely fluid dynamics going on in this bit. It gets a bit rough here. And all this lovely high velocity power is slowed down. The stress is increasing. It's got to then squeeze through a bearing here, they get jolly big bearings, but it's still a problem to squeeze it through, and then it gets, has to be speeded up into a generator here, and there is not room in here for anything at all. Here, I've got a power takeoff which consists of a, a ring cam here, which is running all the way around the yellow structure, <coughs> and it's got lobes that are moving up and down like that, or up and down like that, or up and down like that, and it's got rollers on these cams here, and it's sucking in oil from a low-pressure pipe and pumping into a high-pressure pipe. And this is me, and the size of this is chosen so I don't bang my head <laughs> on, on the roof. Okay. Uh, now, I can actually go around here while this is working, while it's live. It might be a little bit oily and noisy, but I can do that. Another magic thing here is... We've got a, a thing called a gutter seal. If you imagine a gutter and a, a vein coming down into the middle of the gutter, uh, you get different water levels on either side of the vein. Uh, so we've got a, 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 a gutter seal that's working with no contact at all, pretty loose tolerances, uh, and I can have clean, lovely oil stuck up here and dirty salt water down here and no friction contact at all. You can't do that with horizontal axis machines. Right. So let's look a bit more about this. Here's the two together, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about how we might make it. Um, this is looking a bit closer, and the red bit is the cam with these, uh, these lobes. That's the trough, and that's the crest of the cam. And the blue bits are the rollers. All right? And that's probably about the right scale. And here are some numbers. I'm working with a 200 meter diameter uh, rotor, and the circumference of that is 628 meters. And the rise of the cam is about that much, 120 millimeters. And the wavelength of the cam is just under a meter. I want to have that for reasons that you'll come later on. <coughs> and because we've got uh, four lobes on each cam position, that means that there are altogether uh, um, 2,600 cam lobes going around this circumference. All right? And 
the, the, the rollers are arranged on bogies, and the gap between the bogies is 600 kilometres. So that could let me have um, uh, 7,680 rollers. So what's going to happen? Every rotation here, every roller is going to be worked by every cam load. Right? So I'm going to get 20 million operations every time the rotor goes around once. And uh, I've got 10 to 5 newtons. And I, if, we, if, if, we, if, if we packed all the rollers, many rollers we get in on this cam, you can work out what the, what the power is going to be. I haven't done this because I would like you to do it yourselves and I'd like you to be sitting down when you do it, <laughs> right? Because it's quite astonishing. Uh, we don't need to have anything like the full number of, uh, of rollers that we could squeeze in. And the magic of this is that the cost is going to go up with the number of cam lobes plus the number of rollers, but the output goes up with the product of those two. So the bigger you make this, the better it gets, all right? Um, now, one of the reasons why we don't want to use all the cam rollers is as follows. We're trying to use this as a bearing as well. And we don't have to have the same pressures or the same number of rollers being used as we go around. So if you imagine that the water direction is coming down here, we're going to want a bit more force at this side and a bit less on that side. And ditto here, this is upstream. But here, where the rotor is coming into the water, we want to be doing a lot of work because that will offset the bearing. We've been, we've been doing work rather than trying to resist the load and down here maybe a bit less. So we have control of where we distribute the power takeoff in order to make life easy for the bearings. All right? Um, but also, if you've got all these numbers, it doesn't matter at all if a few, you know, 10% of them decide that they don't want to go on working. Um, they'll tell you if they don't because you'll make a slightly different noise and you can pick that up. So we've got tremendous redundancy here. We can have a lot high failure rate we're only losing a tiny bit of the top power capability. Right, so the next the question is, well, how do you make a 200-metre diameter shape that's like that? All right? We, all, all, all surface lines have got to point to the middle. How do you make that? We haven't got 200-metre diameter machine tools. And the way to do it is to use a brilliant idea from a chap called Percelier, who was a French... Uh, artillery officer, and the French artillery officers had to be very good at mathematics, uh, but better than our lot, I think. And uh, one of the interesting things about engineering is how you make a straight line if you haven't got machine tools going to make straight line. How do you make a, a really straight lines that you've machined are copies of the bed of the machine that you made them on? How do you make a straight line from, from nothing? James Watt was the first guy who came up with a very, very good approximation to that. But Perselli was the first guy to come up with a perfect solution to that problem. And it consists of a linkage like this. There's a quadrilateral around here, okay? And there's another pair of links in here. And this point here goes in a straight line if that link is exactly equal to that link. Now, you could say that a straight line is just a circle with infinite radius. And if these two links aren't quite the same, there, then the radius you get is this. So by making a micrometer adjustment of this, I can make th this the uh, radius of curvature here, which is uh, infinite or a little bit less than infinite. And I can easily, by adjusting that, make this particular table here go around in an arc of a very big radius. I'd love to be able to, to make to telescope lenses with you know kilometer long radius curvature. So that's the way we can get part of the uh, of the machine tool made. Um, there would be a grinding wheel or a milling cutter here, and that would be seen in this way here. Here is our cam. This is the wonderful 200 metre diameter radius, sorry, 100 metre radius moving table here. That's the cam here, and on here there is a grinding wheel spinning about this axis, and there's a diamond dresser here, and all these lines here will be meeting a point way down there, 140 metres down in that direction, <coughs> to, uh, to, 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 um, to make this move in the right way. And you can get a very good approximation to this by having a parallelogram here, which isn't, isn't quite parallel here. This has got slightly longer things to make this move in the right curvature. So by understanding linkages, we can make this weird shape 
And we can even build this into the tidal rotor. It doesn't take much space. So we could actually true up the, the cam sections. Uh, well, not while it's running because of the grinding of it, but you could, you could make it, uh, you don't have to bring it ashore to trim up the, the wheels if you want. The, the, the cam itself is made up of short sections which are pulled together like beads on a necklace. It will actually be fairly flexible if I was to get a 200 millimeter square bar, 600 meters long, I could bend that round to a circle from being straight without really overstressing the steel. I'd only get a thousand micro strain on that. So you can get quite a lot of local bending if you want. Right, now, now we're getting on. Right, so we've got uh, no reduction in velocity going from the tips of our blades down to the nacelle. Um, we've got plenty of room for everything. I'm not trying to get all this torque through this bearing. We can get at it in shirt sleeves. We've got thousands and thousands of force lines, not just the three that you get in an epicycle gearbox. And we've got the gutter seal and lots and lots and lots of room. Okay. Now there's some other advantages too. Uh, with um, a conventional turbine, you've got probably two bearings close together at the hub, and then you've got a distributed load all the way along to the tip. And the bending moments up here are the force times the length. Slightly modified a bit because you've got tapers and higher velocities and things. If you support the a blade at both ends, as I'm trying to do, the bending moment's down by a factor of four. But also, here the maximum bending moment and the maximum shear at the same place, here I've got maximum bending moment here and maximum shear at the ends. So from the point of view of the beam, we've got a much, much nicer beam if we're supporting at both ends rather than at one end. Now, imagine that the MOD issued an order that the two stretcher bearers had to be at the same end of the stretcher. Like that. Okay? Is that really a good idea? I don't think it is. But that's exactly what's happening to these two bearings here if you're trying to do variable pitch. So, I'm now going to talk about some how we're doing for time. That's quite a bit. Um, I want to bring in a new concept of flow impedance. Now, everybody who's done electrical engineering knows exactly what the impedance of an electrical current is, and they use it all the time. And this, what I'm going to say, it looks completely familiar to them. They'll just understand. But the oceanographers don't understand that. I've asked everybody, every tidal stream developer, what their figure for, for the, the flow impedance of the pendulum flows, and none of them even replied. Okay? And you know, it was a, a very polite letter that I wrote. Uh, now, I define this as the ratio of the head increase to the flow rate reduction if you put in an obstruction. Right? Now, if you've got a high flow impedance, um, the water says, I'm determined to get through, you try and block me and I'll just raise the head. If you've got a low flow impedance, the water says, oh, I can't get through there, I'll go around bother. Right? So, high impedances are determined to flow and get through, and low impedances don't try at all. Now, the, the, the numbers that you get to define it would be the metres, that's the change in head, and this is cubic metres per second. So we're dividing head by metre per second. So we've got rather funny uh, units of seconds per square metre, which uh, I have to have a mental image, and I don't quite understand what that means. It looks a bit better if you divide by rho g. All right? But, uh, and what's good about that is that if you ever want to have exchanges about tidal stream with uh, people on another planet, they've got a different G, and maybe they're working with a different liquid. So you can use the same equations for interplanetary tidal stream problems. But what's better is that if you uh, want to use the I squared R equations from electrical engineering for power, or V squared over R, they go straight in if you put that rho G. All right? So uh, this really matters quite a lot to get the rho G. Um, and let's go on a bit. I'd like you to look again at this picture of, of a, it's a very recent thing about the velocities around a tidal rotor here. 
the velocity scale here, and you see we're increasing the velocity here, we're reducing it here, and increase here, and there's really quite a big reduction here. And Betts says, if you believe Betts, he says you should be getting about a third of the velocity here as you had undisturbed up, up, upstream. Now what these guys did was to get, this is just to show that their the software was working, they put down a regular array of turbine positions, and then they let the computer jiggle them around, move them randomly, and end up and measure the power increase to find out what the best pattern of the turbine was in an array. A nice experiment. And what they came up with is this. You've got a whole bunch of turbines in a straight line here, fairly close together. That sounds familiar. But with other ones building up here, okay, like a sort of U-shape. Right? So the question I'd like to, to ask is, uh, what would happen if you did this in wider and wider and wider in a channel until you reached the, the, the side walls of the channel? And I think what would happen would be that as you made it wider, these would get longer. But if you said, well, hang on, what are these actually doing? And they're trying to stop the water taking an easy route around the end, around the side here. That's their job. And actually, that's exactly what the side walls of the channel do. This is what Caithness and the Orkneys are doing in the Pen and Firth, which is why I want to have these stringing as much as I possibly can across the whole width of the Pen and Firth. Uh, and I'll be very mean about how much room I leave for fishing boats to get through. We'll leave them enough, but only just. We now come to another question. This is showing the water here is moving much more slowly than the water here. Right, now if we've done this across the whole way, are we going to have the water here going slower than the water here? Because the same amount of water that's coming into the planet has got to go out again. It's not draining into the seabed. It's not evaporating. It's not being drunk by seagulls or anything. It's all got to go through. So if you've got head difference across here, and it won't be a very big head once, it might be 100 millimetres or perhaps 300 millimetres, that sort of amount. If you've got a lower head here, the water's got to be going faster. Same amount of water, slightly sm smaller area, you've got to have a, a velocity increase. So everything that Betts said, and Betts believers said about one third of the incoming stream velocity, has got to be rubbish. Okay, it really has to be rubbish if there's a head, head drop across your, your rotor. Okay, so how can we get uh, the impedance? Well, this is a really complicated problem, um, and it depends on flow rates out in the Atlantic and in the North Sea and all through the channels in the Orkneys and around the top, and it depends on, uh, among other things, the local friction bed losses of the channel, and if you've got obstructions in it or changes of section or changes of flow area or even changes of shape of flow area, those are all uh, trying to impede the, the water flow and their dissipating energy. And what we would really love to know is what the, uh, the, the, the total energy losses of the water going through the Pentland Firth are. How could we get that? Well, uh, we could calculate it a bit if we uh, knew the bed friction coefficient um, for the water going through. And here is a picture of what the bed looks like if there's enough light. And these can go up to about 10 metres long. Oh, no, uh, yeah. And, sorry, three and a half metres long, I beg your pardon, three and a half metres long. And I, I don't know what the fr friction coefficient of that is, but it's, it's got to be some quite nice number. If you go deep, for, into deeper water, stuff looks like this. This is a picture of a 60 millimetre um, uh, marker point, and you can see the size of the rocks around it, roughly. Uh, there are also places where you get a change from a 70 metre water depth down to 100 metre water depth quite abruptly. So there's trenches and gaps and cliffs and all that. Now, um, I think I've got a picture of that here. There are some, I think these are depths here, and you can see there's uh, abrupt obstructions here like this. Uh, probably a rough idea if you want to know how rough this is. Look and see what the rock formations are like on the land. They're a good approximation to what it would be. Well, um, the uh, people have tried different numbers for the bed friction coefficients, and this is shown in this equations here, where they are guessing, they're, they're, they're comparing an actual measurement with an acoustic Doppler current profiler and a, a big computer model which is predicting what the 
the thing that should have been there at that, that position. And they tested this with different assumptions for the, the bed friction coefficient, starting at 2 noughts 1, and then 2 noughts 2 5, and then 2 noughts 5. And in all of the, what they're showing is how well the, the model and the, um, the, the, the actual measurement agree. And if, the, um, if, the, if these lines are on the green line, then that's a perfect agreement. And the, in all these cases, it's showing that there are, these are for three different stations. Um, it's, it's all showing that the, the, the measurement gets better as you rise, raise the value for the, the drag coefficient. But they stop at 2 knots 5. Uh, it, the agreement's getting better, but they stop. Why didn't they go on to her? And I tried to ask them why they didn't do it, and the software license wasn't available or whatever, I don't know. But they, they weren't interested in trying to, to see what happened, how high they should push the drag coefficient to get a better agreement. Now, this is uh, from a very lovely, famous book, which anybody working with fluids ought to keep a copy of. It's the, the lift and the drag coefficients of... Um, of, of hydrofoil sections or aerofoil sections, so hydrofoil is the same. And this is the lowest one in the book, the lowest drag coefficient amount for a NACA uh, 64006. And this is only 6% here of the, of the cord thickness. And we've got the lifts up here, and here we've got the drags plotted against the lift coefficient. And you can see that there is a tiny little area here where the drag coefficient is 2 knots 4. Now this is for the lowest drag that the aerodynamics industry can make, you can see that if you put in a standard roughness, it's about 2.85 up here. So this is a real practical airplane, and this is something that's been made on a, a good, good as a lens grinding machine. Right. Now, they're saying, these guys are saying, they're talking about 2.01, 2.25. They're saying that the drag is of the seabed in the Pentland Firth that looks horribly rugged is not that different from the drag coefficient of a supersonic fighter or a guided missile fin. Now, I don't know what the coefficient is, but I used to make bits for supersonic fighters a long time ago, and I know that the drag coefficient of the Benford is a lot higher. Right? And I started collecting drag coefficients, and so here's our half of a supersonic fighter here. And we've only got... Uh, the water's only seeing one side of the, of, the, of the airplane. And there's a whole bunch of measurements in different places. Um, there's a guy called Campbell who's actually measured it in the Petland Firth. So now we come to another confusion, which is that the, all the fluids people work out a drag on a half row U squared CF, that's the drag force, and all the oceanographers don't do put the half in. And if you're reading different papers at different times and trying to compare results, you forget which is the agreement. So I would love to have a law passed to say that whenever you mention drag coefficient, you put either EN after it or OC after it, so that you'd stop people getting into this confusion. So that's why I put that in red here. Now, Ian Bryden, who used to be here, was one of my PhD students, by the way, he thought that the, the, the friction coefficient was 0.04 and I was guessing 0.016 because of Campbell. Now, somebody else measured it in the... Yes, this chap, Ripith, measured it in the Menai Strait, and he's 2 knots 52. And I couldn't understand how Campbell could measure that and Ripith could measure that. And I phoned up Ripith, and he said that he'd made a mistake and Campbell was right, which is jolly nice and honest of him. So that's, that's where I, I, I came in. Now, um, there's other people up here. So this guy here is measured it for different velocities. When you, the, the flow is enough to get the gravel lifting up, then the coefficient goes up a lot. What's important about this is that the size of the resource of the Pentland Firth, if you take a map of the Pentland Firth and look at all the different velocities all over it and the areas of all these velocities, work out what the bed friction would be. What, what, no, if you work out what uh, area times u squared comes out to, it comes out to 6 terawatts times whatever your number for your friction coefficient. So Ian Bryden was right. We are now wasting at the moment, at the peak flow rate of peak spring, we're wasting 247 gigawatts on the 
bed friction of the Finland Firth. Now, there's maybe a bit more because they've got the drag of all the islands and blockages. Now, uh, if you start trying to take a bit of energy out of that uh, and you knock the velocity down by 1%, you would have 3% less loss from the, all these other drags and corners and eddies and islands and disruptions. So you can take a tiny bit out and the, the energy waste there is, is dropped by 3.3 times more. So this means that all that energy that's not being wasted anymore is available for your turbines. So you could probably get uh, about a third of what's being wasted there now converted to, um, to useful electricity. And a third of 247 gigawatts, about 80 gigawatts, which is more than the entire peak demand of the UK. Right? Now, this means it's quite important to measure what the present losses are, you would have thought, wouldn't you? Right. Um, how could you do that? Well, one way you could do it is to measure the slope of the water. Uh, we, if we know the flow rate and we know the slope, we know what the driving pressure is. Now, that's probably going to change quite a lot through the tidal cycle, uh, but you'd get numbers that you'd get a good feel for that. How could you measure the slope? Well, uh, the first thing I'd looked at was whether you could do it from a satellite. And people do measure ocean depth surfaces and things in satellites. And I talked to them, and they said, sorry, they can't do it because the area is too small. They could tell you the slope of the Pacific or the Atlantic uh, quite well to about a centimetre slope difference. And they can find the gravity is different in different parts of the Earth and they can look at it. But that's taking millions and millions of samples and averaging them up. If you've only got a tiny small area and you, the satellite's you know, getting three measurements every 45 minutes or something, that is not on. But you can do it with things called acoustic Doppler current profilers. And they have, they're really meant for measuring all the turbulence and velocities, but they also build in a little pressure gauge on the bottom. So if you know over a few months the cycling pressure variations on the seabed at the Atlantic and the North Sea end, you could get a good feel from um, what, the, what the slope change is. If you look at the difference in the pressure at each, each side, it, it, you, you want to do it for quite a while because there's all sorts of funny eddies and things. And you might want perhaps 20 acoustic Doppler current profilers at each end, because there could be, it doesn't have to be the same. Um, now, I would love to be able to do that, uh, but when we ask the EPSRC about for money to do this, you always sort of tickle them first before you waste all the time putting any gun it. They said, "Oh, Pentland Firth is is too regional." This is guy, guys in Sweden. For something that might produce 80 gigawatts, being too regional, um, uh, I, I was a bit hurt about that. Um, so, I think that's probably uh, all I've got to say. Um, people have criticised, well, the one other thing I can go on a little bit, the people have criticised this because I've got all these thousands of rollers. Um, and I like large numbers of things if there's a good reason if they've been properly researched. Um, very often, by putting a moving part in, you can stop some braking. Uh, vehicle suspensions are very good examples of complexity, which is making everything much more comfortable than having solid axles. Um, but to illustrate this point, I'll show you quickly another couple of slides here. This is a... Uh, the task is to move material by hand. And the, uh, this is a, a quite a good way to do it. You can do much better than you can by carrying things. But it's got one moving part. Right. Now, here is a thing which has got a lot of moving parts, and it goes about 30 times faster than a wheelbarrow can go. It can go 6,000 times further than a wheelbarrow can go. It can carry 20,000 times more weight than a wheelbarrow could go, and it brought the cost of transport down by two orders of magnitude. All right. uh, now, here's another way of uh, moving things around with no moving parts. You have these two sticks. Well, I suppose they, maybe the, the bends of the sticks are wearing it. And you can carry the load here. But no, no bearings. 
So this is a very good example, I think, of how increasing the number of properly designed moving parts makes engineering and life general a whole lot better. Can I try to answer any questions? This production is brought to you by the University of Edinburgh.